Right. The second slide is about what is a native species, and this is something that uh, some people think this is this is a it's a subjective thing. A native species is that it's a subjective definition. It, it, it's not. It's it's crystal clear what it is. But what what is so uh, confusing is is that there's a geographical context to native, obviously. So giant sequoia is native to North America. It's endemic to California, meaning that's the only place it is. So you might be surprised. I'm going to show you some introductory slides of some things like purple coneflower is not native to New York. It's naturalized, all right? And so we need to be clear on when we're talking about native versus naturalized. We say it works now. <laughs> Oh, it does. <laughs> All right. So, in the other part of a, the definition is there has to be a time element, and the widely accepted time element is prior to European settlement. So, what was the flora in central New York ten thousand and one years ago? It was just bare gravel. There was no native plant here because the glaciers had wiped everything out, and so. Here's a, another thing that if you don't know this, um, hello, we can't see. It's really important. It's, it's from the Biota of North America project, BONAP. And if you put BONAP carefully into a Google search, uh, you'll get to the site. And BONAP shows every single plant species in North America native, naturalized or invasive by county, <laughs> by, by time periods. And so again, we shouldn't waste time with anyone arguing about what native is because it's been cited by these are botanists who have been working for over a hundred years. And so what Mike shows, like here's the Eastern prickly pear. And people come to my garden and they see it in bloom and they sort of start scratching their head because it's the little area in my garden that's devoted to native plants now. And they think that's not native to New York. Well, it is, it's all over the West Point area. And so it, it'll, any, any place that has these lighter green or yellow counties um, shows you that it's native in that county. All right, so it's a really nice source of information for every plant species. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 oh, I, that's the that's what I did wrong the first time. <laughs> can I just can I just sort of wave me or something? That would be the way to do it. Yeah, let them do it. <laughs> it's easier to do a walking to it. All right. So, like purple cone flower is one that um, it's not. It's not native to New York, but it's naturalized. Purple coneflower we use for a lot of examples of a great native plant for this and that and this and that. But it's naturalized. And when you see that sort of blue-green color, that means that it's naturalized. All right. So, and it doesn't matter to me. You know, there, there are people that get really hung up about, like my brother who worked for the Northern Kentucky University for a good portion of his career for doing mitigation projects. Their projects were funded richly, but only if all the propagules came from the county in which the mitigation project was. And so they spent a lot of time collecting seeds and making cuttings. And so if something, this was Northern Kentucky. So if a mitigation project was in Campbell County, everything had to be collected from Campbell County. The, the problem is, is that you, you're sort of limited to plant material. So for when we did the green roof, at ESF, and we wanted some really rare plants on it, like prairie smoke, which is in New York, but the Watertown area in one site, and you're not allowed to collect it. We ended up buying ours from a restoration nursery uh, that was really reliable, but the gene pool is somewhere out in the, in the Midwest. Now, I don't think that's necessarily bad, but that's what this nativeness, a lot of it has to do with the genetics, underlying genetics. Uh, there we go. Uh, so if you see any of these colors associated with the species, well, the name, you know, right now, 
it's not native to anywhere in North America, and that's purple loose stripe. So if you see blue or purple or this blue green, <clears throat> it's not native to those counties. Okay, so that resolves what's native and what's not. <laughs> the next uh, topic is you know, native plant species. We often just sort of think of them as out there. They're all alone. Well, they are typically surrounded by 20, 30, 40, 50 other native plant species. And when they're in an assemblage, a repeatable assemblage based on the site characteristics, then we refer to that assemblage as a plant community. And plant communities can be really common, beach maple forest, or they can be really rare, like in inland salt marsh. So what are natural communities? Every state in the country has a natural community uh, summary. And sometimes it's a book, and then some of these books are great. I mean, the, I don't think I show, I'm not showing Vermont. Oh, the Vermont one, they're all really interesting. Mm -hmm. And it talks about these assemblages based on the site conditions. New York put out one of the first ones, and it's, it was a modest uh, production, but then they've updated it on the web. So if you want to know the New York natural communities, you can't get a nice book, but you can go to Natural Communities of New York City, and it'll come up. It's actually called Ecological Communities. And it turns out that when you start being <clears throat> real fine scale, based on data, that in New York, there's over 200 natural communities. But in fact, if you're out and about, you might think there's maybe five, five or 10. You're not meant to read this. Uh, it's meant to show you the detail for these written descriptions. And so that description for a forest will be the trees that are in the overstory, subcanopy trees, shrubs, herbaceous, moss, typically the bird species associated with it, sometimes other unique features. So this is the description for the beach maple forest, which is what you would find at uh, Baltimore Woods would be a great example. So these are, again, these are not like somebody's dreaming up this stuff. It's based on lots of data, publications, a lot of other sources. All right, so what I've done to make this more manageable um, and less academic is to sort of throw a bunch of related types into broader types. And so these are some of the broad examples for central New York. Old Field, old, old Field historically, this was one of the rarest. In fact, it didn't exist, Old Fields. Old Fields are a product of, the new, of, of abandoned agriculture. So New York State, 1920, was 20% forest, 1920. And that includes the Adirondack Park and Catskill. So what does that mean for central New York? There weren't many forests here. And then the land was abandoned, Old Fields result. And instead of showing you those list of species and heritage uh, shows, I just put in some pictures of those species. See how many you, you recognize. I'm not going to go over them, so you won't know if you're right or wrong. <laughs> that way you'll feel better. It's, make sure you don't leave your depressed. All right, uh, mixed music hardwoods. And all these shots are from central New York representing these communities. So mixed means it's a mixture. Mesic means middle of the road moisture. So you, there's hydric, which is wet, seric, dry, mesic in the middle of the moisture. This is actually Rand Track, one of my favorite places to see uh, wildflowers. These are the species, and they're different species here than you might find in all the other types. And so the underlying reasons have to do with soil moisture, soil richness. Um, basic uh, site factors. And then there's a sub canopy unique to this type. And, and, and you'll re recognize these are some of our most favorite uh, plant species that we use for, for native gardening. And there's one of the richest uh, herbaceous layers of all the natural communities. So let's take a little bit of water off of it. Let's call it dry. Mixed hardwoods. This is over Chittenango Southwest facing slope where you get drier sites. And instead of sugar maple, black maple. 
instead of better than hickory. Shag bark instead of what well, else? Chickapin oak and there's white oak and so because it's a little bit dry. Pine hemlock forest. Well, you know if you know anything mm -hmm. anything about pine hemlock forest, if you're looking for like the the pink lady slipper, this is where you go. They're consistently there if they're there at all. And so you get the painted trillium there. You get the uh, machella repens, the partridge berry, because those conditions evergreen is different than being just shaded by a deciduous forest. The pine and hemlock create more acidic conditions. Hardwood swamps, this is the boardwalk from Labrador. If you've not ever done that, any time of year, it's one of the nicest little walks in central New York, but a different array of species. It's wet. These are wetland plants. And so you get, instead of white ash, you get black ash. You get black gum, you get high bush blueberry, you get red maple, lots of spice bush, um, one of my favorite native plants. And I'm, I just wish more people would use it. A point of sumac. <laughs> <laughs> so wet meadows, it's another type. In wet meadows, we often use a lot of these species for pollinator gardens. These are, you know, the members of the aster family that just are so good at attracting uh, all kinds of pollinators. We have uh, some really cool wetlands in central New York that don't exist in large amounts, hardly anywhere else in the country. And one of them, we have a lot of fens, which are calcareous. They're, they're fed by groundwater that's high in calcium, but at the ultimate end of that calcareous uh, condition, where the pH is around eight, these are marl fens in central New York. White Lake was the finest example in New York State. White Lake today is the finest example of a Phragmites swamp. But the marl is still there and maybe someday Somebody or some group will figure out a way to try to start restoring that. This is the marl fen at Virgin Swamp. So not only do are there plant species, this is one of the only two places in the state for the Massasauga rattlesnake. Yeah. Just a quick question. So are these examples of native plant communities rather than just plants that you can use? Exactly. So and so within the marl fen. That's the only place in the whole state you'll find the horizontal juniper naturally. Mm -hmm. It's the only place in the whole state that juniperus horizontalis, of which you know all the horticulture, you know, Bar Harbor, Wilton, all this. But if you want to see it how it's supposed to be without that lack of genetic variation, it's so neat to see it over at Virgin, especially in these open marl areas where that's where the Massasauga bath during the sunny days. And it's just so cool to run into a rattlesnake when you're out <laughs> looking at plants. The Houghton's goldenrod and the white lady slipper and some really neat plants, but you won't find them anywhere else in the state or outside of the state, mm -hmm. except in marl fens. We have some really great bogs in upstate New York. This is one of my favorites, just east of Jam Pond, which is, uh, or just east of Marathon, it's called Jam Pond a quaking mat that's 10 times the size of this room. So with every step you take, you have a chance of falling through, never to be seen again, preserved forever. <laughs> and, and these are some of the neatest species. In fact, this is one of the, one of the most unique array of species of any natural community. So you have all these heath species that have this very efficient nutrient uh, recycling. You have, some of our 45 different sphagnum species, usually 15 or so in any one bog. You have orchids galore, you have cranberry, blueberries, you have the carnivorous plants, sundews and pitcher plants and ladder works. So it's just so neat to go to these places. Plus you've got that extra chance of falling through, which makes it really exciting. The pine barrens in New York, you just go over to Rome Sandplains. You don't have to go to Albany. The Rome Samplings, are what a neat example of pine barrens. And so there's only two places in the state for the climbing fern, like Godium palmatum, and that's one of them, mm -hmm. because the conditions are just right. That's where you get the scrub oak and the blue native blue lupin and the pitch pine and the gray birch. Now the dunes in New York state, so think of all of Lake Ontario. There's only 16 miles of natural dunes, and that's basically the area from Sandy Creek on up just south, just south of Watertown. It's the only natural dunes. Everything else that's 
got those sand deposits is artificial. But on those dunes, you get one of the rarest willows, the dune willow, you get sand cherry, sand cherry here, and you get some really neat plants adapted to those, they're actually calcareous sands, and they are excessively drained. One of my favorite areas in central New York is the water, are the Alvar pavement barrens, areas of limestone with different amounts of soil or organic matter. And probably in terms of the number of rare species, this is one of the most exciting places, I think, in the Northeast. Plus fields and fields of yellow lady slippers and Indian paintbrush and you know, some common plants like the columbine, which occurs widely anywhere there's calcium, but some of these are unique, like the uh, death kamas, I wonder if it's poisonous, um, is, uh, is only found there. Prairie smoke discovered on the Alvars in 1981, a botanist had gotten a flat tire around Chameau and while he was waiting for AAA, thankfully it took them hours, he found this plant, <laughs> first time seen in New York, and then he thought, this must be special, and it turns out that he discovered the Alvars in New York, which are part of the Great Lakes' rarest communities, and, and similar to the Burren in Ireland, which we had a chance to uh, visit last summer to see some of the incredible orchids. We wonder how many other things could be discovered. <laughs> you know, we're still, we're still discovering stuff in the state. And uh, which is hard to believe because New York has been more heavily botanized than a place like Kansas. And uh, we're so here's the inland salt marsh that's Millie Faust, 1936, with students of the day. I keep on asking our students to dress like this, and they just completely. <laughs> and notice all their tattoos and other things. Uh, anyway, 1936, that's the inland salt marsh down by the regional market. Here it is today. So there's three of these left in all of central New York. We're doing a lot of restoration work in a few of them because we've, we found some sites that have these salt springs. And so we think we can create these. And there's a lot of reasons for them. Uh, interesting species, edible species. That's one of the three that's left. All right. So now we're going to forget about natural communities and, and talk about species for difficult sites, but by big categories. All right. So what might be some of those categories? If you think about difficult sites. All right. So wet. All right. You got wet conditions. You know, it's amazing how many people over the years have asked me, uh, you know, they want to. They want. They have a wet area. It actually sounds interesting, and they want to get rid of it. I mean, why? why would you, what areas give you uh, a habitat for at least a third of all the native species that are most showy? And if you don't have wet, you're sort of out of luck. You can't. You can't grow up. I mean, you can try, but you're not going to have much luck. So wet areas. This is uh, up at Baltimore, uh, Beaver Lake. Uh, near the uh, on board one. All right, so I'm going to go through these quickly, and in all cases, I'm going to start with uh, ferns, grasses, wildflowers, herbaceous species, uh, shrubs, and trees in that order. Okay. Ostrich fern, uh, one of the most delicious of all native plants. <laughs> Forty-five bucks a pound of Wegmans if you want to buy the fronds in the spring. Uh, you can, I mean, if you have it in your garden, you're going to eventually need to control it. It is so aggressive. If it's wet, if it's dry, don't bother. It's just not going to work. You can put it in pots, uh, cinnamon fern. Now, on the list that I have for you, I updated all of the nomenclature. There's about 20 name changes. There's no longer, there's no asters in New York State anymore. The common name applies but there is no genus of aster in New York State. Osmunda cinnamomi is now Osmunda, uh, Osmundastrum. I didn't make these up. All of the nomenclature, all of the ranges, you can find on the New York Flora Atlas. It's, I mean, I spend, I, I probably am on that site more than any other single site during the course of a week, the New York Flora Atlas. 
for every native or naturalized species. It'll show the counties in which it has been documented and has the updated nomenclature. It has a common name, not necessarily one that we might have learned. Our royal fern is still Osmunda regalis. So we have spots in our uh, yard that uh, are naturally very poorly drained. Uh, they, they take a lot of water off the uh, gutters. And we're really thankful for that because we have this expansive, mostly cinnamon fern and ostrich fern that anywhere else we wouldn't have been able to have that. And it's pretty striking. Um, it's what separates you know, one garden from another is when you have these unique elements. The very worst situation to have would be nice, sunny, amazing sites without anything peculiar. And that's what a lot of gardens are. And that's why a lot of them are not as interesting as they might be otherwise. Um, the northern sea oats, you know, I, this is invasive, but it's native. Uh, it's not native to New York, it's native to just around New York. But, you know, be aware of it. The, the thing that is worth recommending is that there aren't many grass-like plants you can grow in the shade. And this is one that really thrives, th overly thrives if you have a re really rich uh, site. My brother there, soft rush. I'm not gonna say a lot about a lot of these. It's, you know, all that information is elsewhere. Swamp milkweed. Now you can grow swamp milkweed in a regular garden, but it's gonna be more robust. It's gonna be a lot more interesting under wetter, sunny conditions. Turtle head. So some of these, I've not had much luck outside of the wet setting. You can try, but you know, why do you want to spend your time gardening, bathing and things when you can just put something in the ground, let it go and enjoy it. <laughs> Joe Pieweed. Rose Mallow. <clears throat> you can see this out at uh, Montezuma in the uh, about August. You know, these are 12 inches in diameter, these flowers. And you see thousands and thousands of these plants if you drive the loop road out of Montezuma. Boy, this thing, now, now this thing wants to just take <laughs> off with the blue flag. And some of them, when I started talking about these 38 years ago, there was no variety. There were no varieties of a lot of these. And this is something that's been debated. Do you want to use a variety of a native plant? It depends on what, if, if you want something for a pollinator and that variety doesn't provide the, the pollen, or if, if it doesn't provide other things that are ecologically important, then you might want to stay away from them. But the blue flag, the varieties, really it's about darker foliage. It's not like it's going to, that's going to make it take over the world or something. Sometimes the varieties are more aggressive, so you have to be careful about that. The cardinal flower, yeah, you can grow this outside of water, but if you put it in any place that's got water, it's going to be, you know, I've seen them five feet tall. I mean, five feet tall with 100 flowers, and you get dozens of hummingbirds on them. The American wisteria is native, not to New York, to the Midwest. And it's a riparian species. It grows up these floodplain trees 50 feet high. Uh, it's slower growing than the Japanese and Chinese, which is good because those two are just really aggressive. But uh, there's some really neat varieties of this. Amethyst Falls is one. We've been planting, you know, we planted one at our daughter's house not long ago, and it's just doing so nicely. But it's really, there's no need to plant Japanese and Chinese wisteria. The red chokeberry. Very common in downstate New York around vernal pools. And uh, this is one of those plants of spring flowers, some great fall color, fruit display. Uh, it's one of my favorites for cordials, a quart of fruit, a <laughs> quart of vodka, a cup of sugar. <laughs> the button bush, uh, it's a butterfly magnet. One of the few shrubs that will grow in standing water. Um, it doesn't have to be planted in a wet soil, but it will be a lot lusher under those wet conditions. Summer sweet plethora is a wetland plant. Many, many, many varieties. Small, large, white, pink flowers. Silky dogwood is a wetland dogwood. Red twig dogwood. 
Winterberry. It's so much fun to we spent a lot of time driving back and forth to Ann Arbor in Montpelier. And every time you see a little pocket of swamp, there's the winterberry. And sometimes I almost ran off the road the last time we saw it on the way to Ann Arbor. Now we just bought a Subaru that'll apparently if you take your eyes off of the road, <laughs> like the alarm goes off. And this is this is not going to work for us. But so I'm not. I'm, I won't be driving anymore. So <laughs> because I, I there was a winterberry that if I see it again, I'm going to pull over and mark it because the fruit display, the size of the fruit, was pretty much unlike anything I've seen in production right now. The Virginia sweet spire. You know, I've, I've seen this a lot in the Mid Atlantic region, walking on a boardwalk with three feet of water on either side, and there's this shrub coming out. It's just amazing on how much water it tolerates. Swamp azalea. This one smells even better than it looks. The swamp rose. You got a wet site and you want to put a rose in, this thing will spread like crazy. It's rice ominous and it's a, just a beautiful six foot high plant. The wide rod or uh, wild raisin, Viburnum castellanus. We have a lot of viburnums that are native to New York State, but they sort of sort out along moisture gradients. And this one is in some of the wetter conditions. Yellow root, great ground cover with a yellow root. Some trees, river birch. Shellbark kickery, this is one of the rarest trees in New York. It grows in the riparian area south of Owasco Lake. Seven leaflets, bark like shell bark, fruit the size of a tennis ball. The meat tastes like a butter pecan. It's one of the most delicious of all native plants I've ever had. Atlantic white cedar on Long Island, especially common into the New Jersey pine barrens. Sweet gum, another wetland tree. So these are all really well suited. I mean, they, they grow in wetlands naturally. You don't have to, you know, this is a tree tree. You don't have to water along the street if you grow this. Sweet bay magnolia. A black gum. The black gum is a, a, a weird tree ecologically, like red maple. It's on the driest sites, it's on the wettest sites. Mm -hmm. It doesn't consistently hang out. Well, like sugar maple, it's gotta be just, it's like, Gold, uh, was Goldilocks putting a uh, porridge? It's got to be just right because anything on either side, uh, this tree can't compete on a nice soil. It's stuck on the really bad wet sites and dry sites. It's a cool tree locally. This is the one that was over harvested during the big salt production in the 1800s in Syracuse when Syracuse was the largest salt producer in the United States. A lot of that salt, the brine water was transported by with black gum logs because they're often hollow. And that's why they make great bee trees. Mm -hmm. A swamp white oak, some of the oldest trees left in Syracuse in neighborhoods and on Genesee Street are swamp white oaks, pin oak. These are all wetland trees. A willow oak, <laughs> black willow. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't want to plant black willow around where you're going to park your car because the tree will at some point fall down on it. But in a park or in a setting that uh, you don't have to worry about the tree collapsing on uh, anything, any activity, then it's a really fine, beautiful, light textured tree. And bald cypress. I wish we, I wish people would plant this more. It is native to the southern New Jersey, uh, not New York, but it we. We've got a 120 year old in Oakwood Cemetery and it grows in 10 feet of standing water for 2,700 years. Pretty amazing tree. All right, and just an, so an application, you're putting, what do you do with these assemblages if you, you, know, if you want to do this? Uh, rainwater basins, we, I don't know why we don't have more of these, but this was one put in at Syracuse University years ago using seaside goldenrod, which is typically in, on the dunes in these wet environments. So it's removed from the moisture, but then putting sedges and blue flag and the wetland plants in where the water is deepest. So, you know, you use these in, use these in combinations in a way to do some pretty interesting alternatives to that was just lawn. All right, All right how about both, uh, parking lot? Not like it didn't rain in the past week, dry. 
but like gunks, these are pitch pine that are 400 years old and the gunks on, sh on this shale, really dry. So where, I, where you would also find the prickly pear. Uh, there's some really cool ferns under really dry. I had this one at my previous garden and unfortunately did not transplant it. Um, this is because I haven't been able to find it, Chilanthes linosa. The Chilanthes are all pretty much dry site species. And, you know, it's, it's got to be attractive when you're called a hairy lip fern. <laughs> the hay-scented fern, this is one of three ferns in New York State not protected by state law. All the others are. And it's not protected because it's incredibly invasive, but it's native. You don't eat the fiddleheads, but for full shade, full sun, full dryness, the hay-scented fern is a really nice uh, fern. Uh, Professor Rizal, can you explain that phrase you just said? It's not protected because it's invasive, but native? Okay. Yeah, so there's uh, New York State, all the terrestrial orchids that are native are protected. All the ferns are protected except three, bracken sensitive and um, that one, because they don't need protection because you, they're bulletproof. You can dig them up and it'll just keep on. In fact, I've had, we have a, I have a colleague who has bracken fern at his house not far from us, and they realize they made a mistake. You know, you see bracken fern in the Adirondacks, and it's cool, and and you plant it, and you'll never plant it again. It is uh, some of these species are tenacious, so if you want something foolproof, you won't have anything else. But bracken, <laughs> marginal shield fern. If you go out to Clark, any of these limestone rock places, you see a lot of of the marginal shield fern. Butterfly weed, prairie smoke, blue lupin. So you can plant the maritime lupins, the hybrid from Europe, probably uh, phyllus, or you can live for two or three years, or you can plant this one in the right conditions, it'll live for 50 or more. It's the only plant that the carnar blue butterfly will eat when it's a larva. It doesn't, you know, the adults will go after any source of pollen or, or nectar, but it's when it's um, the larva come out in May, this plant is critical for the survival of this, one of the rarest butterflies in the Northeast. <laughs> the uh, wild bergamot. Here's an example where the Monarda includes didyma, which is for moist sites, shaded sites. And this plant really should be on like a road cut, any place that's just gravelly, no soil at all, sunny. So the genus does not tell you anything about the best conditions for that particular species. It's, it's amazing when you have these big genera in particular, how the species sort of sort out over all of these different gradients, environmental gradients. That's the prickle, that's actually from my garden, uh, the older garden, just, just took over. That was really cool. Prairie coat flower. So these are all for bone dry sites. The devil's walking stick. Got a really beautiful planting of it uh, on our campus. Bearberry, one of the best evergreen ground covers I've ever seen. The fringe tree. I first saw fringe tree on the granite dome down in the around Atlanta. So these are granite domes. There's no soil on them, just little pockets. And there's fringe tree growing on it. It's also a floodplain species. So what do you think it tolerates? Anything you can possibly throw out in that. Really cool in flower, olive family. Huckleberry, also delicious tasting. Shrubby St. John's word. Sand cherry on the dunes of Lake Ontario. We've got it on campus and real where we had this gravelly soil. We could have ameliorated the soil, but I asked that we not. And then we planted this stuff on basically gravel. Beautiful in flower, fruit, fall color. Fragrant sumac. Of course, there's a famous horticultural variety called low grow, but the, the original is, is pretty attractive. Wing sumac. Gray birch, smoke tree. <clears throat> These pictures are from a planting on uh, in Ann Arbor along the street. It's a really nice street tree because it tolerates drought. 
and it's small. You don't have to worry about topping it, which is hideous. Uh, hawthorns. Pitch pine. Here it is growing on raw quartzite sand of the New Jersey pine barrens out of a rock on Sebago Lake in Maine. I mean, this is one tough tree. And one of the coolest oaks, scrub oak. It's only about 12 feet high. Leaves look like a miniature black oak. This, this is the one over in the Albany pine bush you see a lot of, along with dwarf chestnut oak. The shingle oak. This is a oak that I grew up with in northern Kentucky. It's a red oak. It's got a single bristle tip, and it's very drought tolerant. And it's perfectly hardy here. We've got it all over the cemetery and the campus. Black oak, uh, chestnut oak, and uh, bur oak. Real fine stand of chestnut oak up at Whiskey Hollow. Black oak. These are all really, really drought tolerant. And the one application of these drought tolerant species when we planted the Gateway Green Roof in 2012, we selected some of the most drought tolerant species of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous. All right, saline. So let's say you've got a salty site. This is what I wish we'd be more creative in downtowns, especially Syracuse, instead of ugly. I know it's redundant, Stella Doro, uh, Bay Lilies. Um, <laughs> and instead of things that get, have to be planted every year, mm -hmm. that we start thinking about species that will come back under these really difficult conditions. Seaside goldenrod, we discovered a few years ago here in Syracuse. We discovered it first along the expressway where the salinities were highest because of DOT road salt application. And it's a beautiful goldenrod. It's about about head high, it blooms a month later than the, all the other native golden rods. So when the monarchs are coming out of the north and they are looking for it, you know, to get juiced up, there's a great source of, of uh, nectar for them. Prairie board uh, core grass. This is a photograph I took before the waste beds were reclaimed. This is a pH is eight right at the surface. Mm. It's 12, eight inches below the surface, 12. Oh. And here's this plant that's thriving. So can it tolerate anything in downtown Syracuse? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but thinking about these kinds of plants and medians that'll come back every year, they can't be too tall because that would be a problem for traffic. The horizontal juniper, you know, you know it as a horticultural selection, but it's really a neat plant in its native habitat. Northern Bayberry, that, that's another one with a name change. It's now Morella. The beach plum, this is one that I would say one of the most neglected of any plant that I can think of, native plant. Excellent in flower, very salt tolerant. Here it is on the North shore of Long Island and the fruit, it's small. It's about the diameter of my thumbnail, but it's delicious. It makes great cordials, jams, jellies, pies. Eastern red cedar, here it is on the waste beds before they were reclaimed. Same deal, pH of eight to 12 within about 12 inches of substrate. <laughs> Blackjack oak, which is uh, found on uh, Long Island um, in New York. And post oak, another oak found on Long Island. And these are probably hardy here, so we ought to be trying some of these. And then for retention basins, these are some of the species you might consider to uh, put together for or for, for roadside medians, or median, not roadside, in the middle of the road. All right, low pH. Well, these are all plants that thrive in bogs. And a lot of the bog plants, probably you're not going to use in landscaping a whole lot, although you could if you, so I've, you know, I've been creating these little pockets of bogs in my garden. And New Jersey tea, it's a nitrogen fixer, thrives under acidic conditions. One of the, probably one of the best five plants for a pollinator garden. Sweet fern, not a fern. <laughs> Pea berry. So if you have really acidic conditions, which isn't the case in central New York, but it's the case in a lot of other places. Um, this is the only place I've ever been for a while where the soils tend to be alkaline more than acidic. Mountain laurel, 
Pinchster azalea, <coughs> low bush blueberry. You know, so if you want to grow these in central New York, and if your soil has a high pH, you, you can adjust it. It's easy to adjust with sulfur granules. You don't need to necessarily replace it with a peat. High bush blueberry is native to acidic swamps. Half of Cicero swamp, half of that 6,000 acre Cicero swamp. Half of the biomass is high bush blueberry. Mm -hmm. uh, sourwood, I saw a planting on Mass Avenue right on the edge of the Harvard campus. Years ago, the trees are probably 100 years old. Here's a tree we will never think about planting, except when you see it and you know of its all these beautiful attributes. If you've got acidic soils, I would absolutely uh, plant it, like in the, the Albany area. Uh, we made a bog on um, at uh, where my office is um, years ago to prove to some landscape architects when we specked out a bog for one of the new buildings that never happened. Uh, they made us prove that you could do a bog, and we did. And so anyway, we have all kinds of orchids in there and cranberries and all kinds of cool bog plants. Creating a bog is one of the easiest natural communities to create. You just need something to hold water, like a kiddie pool from Kmart. And the substrate is half peat, half sand. You don't fertilize it. You just keep it wet and all these plants will thrive. Pitcher plants, if you want pitcher plants in your gardens. All right, high pH, these would be alkaline, wild columbine, shrubby sinkafoil. Here's another name change. It's all, the, the name is now Dezephora. Fruticosa, but shrubby sycophoil is actually native to the most alkaline habitats. It'll tolerate acidic, it'll, it'll tolerate everything but full shade. Uh, black maple, black maple is especially abundant in central New York, like at Clark, where it's closer to the limestone bedrock. A lot of the sugar maple there is actually black maple. Looks just like sugar maple, but it's not yellowwood. <laughs> Yellow wood has yellow wood and yellow fall color, beautiful summer flowers, uh, early June, mid June. Chickapin oak out of Clark, some of those are probably 350, 400 years old at the base of the rim trail where all that limestone cobble develops. A really fine street tree. Schumard oak was discovered recently in New York over in the Niagara Falls region. Schumard oak is one of the, uh, another tree that I grew up with in Northern Kentucky. Kind of looks like red oak, pin oak hybrid, but it's a distinct species, really good for alkaline soils. Fast growing oak, Northern white cedar, amazing tree ecologically. Uh, this is so, Honey, Honeywell and O'Brien and Gear and others came to us years ago because they had problems with these waste beds. I don't know why they're, you know, the, the problems where the pH is eight to 10, there's not a speck of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And they kept on planting stuff and everything died. And so, so they gave us five acres of this 15 acre site, a lot of money. Uh, we hired a lot of students and we bought a bunch of plugs. And all we did is we put down a, one application of miracle Grow fertilizer. We didn't do anything else. We didn't do <laughs> compost and all this other stuff. And this was the site two years after we planted those two inch plugs. Wow. And so we have, so this site had no species on it for 55 years because everything that invaded it locally couldn't handle the conditions. The site now has 178 species on it that, were, <laughs> that we planted many and many have colonized. And so it's a matter of understanding the site conditions, picking the right species. And then I'll end this up with, I think, I hope this is it, the, uh, some shade plants. And I'm talking about really, really dense shade. And this is a really, I had a talk down at Brooklyn Botanical Gardens years ago, and they put me up in this hotel. I don't know where it was, but I had to walk by the basketball arena, forget the name. But I walked down row after row, neighborhood after neighborhood of basically there were caves. The right. buildings were created caves. They didn't get a single speck of sunlight in these neighborhoods. 
And I never realized how, you know, I know there's always a question, what do you plan on our Norway maple? Well, the solution to that is to cut the damn Norway maple down. <laughs> but in these places where you've got this shade imposed by things you're not going to remove, what do you do? Well, so there are ferns adapted to the most shaded conditions. Maidenhair fern, <clears throat> lady fern, some sedges, the sedges with the broader leaves are adapted to the most shaded conditions. 204 sedges native to New York. How many of those are you using in your garden? You have a choice of 204. There's a lot out there and a lot of them are available. The wild ginger, this is, it's almost like a shade gatherer. It's an incredible plant. Under the, I've got it under three, four, five layers of vegetation, and it will still thrive and really a neat flower. Mm -hmm. The black snake root, uh, this is another name change, Actea. Full, all these are from mostly from our garden, our old garden, and mostly full shade. The Allegheny spurge, the mm -hmm. native Pachysandra, mm -hmm. the blood root. So cool in flower, fruit, and uh, foliage. And the roots of the rhizomes, great if you've got kids, grandkids, to tease them with. Uh, goldenrods we think of as old field species, and yet some are found in the deepest shade, like the blue stem goldenrod. And the flex of co uh, collis is equally shade tolerant. Foam flower, great ground cover. Sweet shrub. Bush honeysuckle, leatherwood, usually starts blooming April 1st. We're getting closer to that critical date. The dwarf favigella, we had this on the north side of our house underneath an eave. I don't think it ever got a minute of direct sunlight and beautiful in flower. Now this is native to the mid-Atlantic region and the Carolinas. Witch hazel, our native witch hazel. Smooth hydrangea. So the big leaf hydrangeas, oak leaf and smooth are the shade plants. The paniculata, the one that's not native, small leaf, not good for the shade. There's the oak leaf. I've seen this in some of the darkest, deepest gorges in the uh, south of here. And it is so cool to see, especially with that big white flower head and such a dark setting. The spice bush, eaten by the spice bush swallowtail. Neat and flower fruit. It's another one. It's another April 1st about when it flowers. Rose Bay Rhododendron. It's a big stand of it over near Utica. So it is native to upstate New York. Flowering raspberry. Raspberry is generally for full sun, but not this one. Beautiful in deep shade. Mm -hmm. Ladder nut. Red buckeye. We've got this on campus. I was down at Cornell Plantation many years ago, 15 hummingbirds on one red buckeye at the Cornell Plantation. So, I mean, it's, it's almost scary when you get that many hummingbirds together. <laughs> Service berry. Kind of funny, you know, when I started talking about native plants 38 years ago, you know, you, you never saw this anywhere. Now it's everywhere. Now you now I'm starting to say maybe I should not even mention it. <laughs> Paul Paul, native to New York. Great in flower, fruit, fall color, form is beautiful pyramidal. What a cool plant. American hornbeam. Eastern red bud, not native to New York, naturalized from the planting, but it's if you go down to Ithaca, that trip hammer exit that's all over the place because it's naturalized really nice uh, native tree native to most of the east alternate leaf dogwood american holly we've actually got this growing out at the lafayette experiment station so it's marginally hardy here big leaf magnolia there was one of these growing at cornell plantations for years and they had to cut it for their visitor center, so but it was hardy here. And so we did an application of sort of these native shade uh, plants. We I had a graduate seminar a while ago now, and we brought all these plants and did course with the debris into a planting on campus between two buildings, and it just doesn't get much sunlight. But uh, there's benches in here now, and 
there was a poll on campus years ago and this 30 by 30 foot area is most people's favorite spot on campus. I mean, it's, it's sad in a way, but it's when you have an urban campus to have a little refugia for students who are, this is what they grew up with. And then they're in Syracuse. It's quite a shock, but uh, you know, even a small place can really do a lot for your mental condition. All right, and then there are a few species that tolerate anything. Let's just say, you know, I, get, I don't know what my, I don't know if my soil's wet or dry or shady or, well, the plant switchgrass. <laughs> it's a really amazing native uh, grass, lots of varieties. Eastern nine bark, uh, red maple. And there's some references. So with that, I think that's it. I'll have, I have, I'll have whatever time for questions I'm allowed. So. <laughs> So we're going to alternate between in-person questions and I hope those people are clapping on Zoom. <laughs> questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a specific uh, plant that has the name, but it never seems to be mentioned and it's not in your list. New York ironweed. So, uh, Veronia, uh, New York ironweed, is that native to New York? <laughs> I think I read, you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, Pisces marine is a great example of names. Uh, Pisces marine means of Maryland. Black spruce. Black spruce in Maryland, there's one little place for it. And so sometimes names are accurate or used to be accurate, but that must be native to New York. Um, it's certainly a, a fine wetland plant. It's one of my favorite plants. It, it is a beautiful it's color. New book. You know what? I, why is that? <laughs> Maybe it should be in some future edition. <laughs> I've been asked to revise this uh, a number of times, but we've been trying to push other other books, other projects, and yeah, you know, where I have it. I, I think it's a nice plant. Yeah, I mean, it's great for butterflies. I've got pictures of butterflies on it. I don't every, know. every year it gets 10, 12 feet taller. Yeah, I I need to spend some time with that. Um, I don't see it in any of the wetlands that I work in in Central New York. Do you, you see much of it? It's, it's not native to Central New York, right? It's, it's, maybe that's. But did, did, was it spec'd out for any of the Onondaga Lake? I don't we know. have it in Onondaga Lake. We can plant it there. It's done fine. And it's nice and tall, like you say. Yeah, it's nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's over at um, the the uh, big wetland we did over by, uh, was it Harbor Brook or somewhere? But anyway, yeah, it's just not in central New York, but it's it's and a very got, nice place. I've got areas that I haven't been mowing regularly, and it's popping up everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know when, when I did the book in 2005, it was based on you know what I knew at the time, and I spent a lot. Most of my graduate work was in the Cumberland Plateau, and in the uh, Southern Appalachians, uh, Western North Carolina, below the Smokies. And so you're sort of you're biased by plants you've spent your life, good portion of your life with. And then coming to New York was actually an eye opener because there are so many. We have fens here that you know there was one fen I visited before ever coming to Central New York. It was in Indiana, and it was kind of pathetic compared to the the fens in New York are incredible birds and swamps 6,000 acres of a whole range of fen habitats and New York has you don't have to go to the Adirondacks for all of these really cool places but I wish I had, had a little bit more experience with some of the New York stuff before writing that and that's I mean, I've made notes about what I want to put in the next edition that's not happening those <laughs> not until Someone publishes my Boggs Bourbon and Beer book. I am not, I am not revising anything until that book is published. It's written. We just, you know, you, you know, I've, I've published seven books, and it, they've all been so easy to get people to want to publish it. And but for some reason, this one's not working. <laughs> so um, when planting wetland plants to stream side. How do you recommend I keep them from washing out during a heavy rain during the rising water? I heard of using coir, C O I R, but did not know how to use it specifically. Well, you can put down, uh, you know, burlap or or some type of netting or other materials. Um, a lot of the like this button bush, red twig dogwood, you stick in stakes without roots. There's no roots on them, so you you have a stake this tall, uh, three feet tall. 
and you stick it in a paint away, that's not going to probably wash away. I mean, there are all these events that are so extreme that I just saw a video yesterday of the flooding in New Hampshire is catastrophic because of all the flooding in the just east of here. Um, so there are conditions under which nothing would survive, but there are physical things you can put to minimize the loss due to erosion or stream flow, but catastrophic anything, whether it's drought or flooding, um, that's the thing that worries me most. Not so much global warming, but the catastrophe is becoming more catastrophic, whether it's hurricanes or wh whatever it is. I mean, that's what is, I think, something we, as gardeners, are going to be more and more. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. I look every day, I go, I, I look at things as I go to the car, and the buds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I, I actually want those below 30 temps for at least another month or two. We're on the verge of things starting to break bud. And, you know, the apple trees and things that aren't native, they're even more susceptible to these weird changes in our uh, extremes. But, um, it, I think it's going to be harder and harder to garden I, because of these extremes. What what can you do? You can't go out and cover everything. If last year we the early spring damaged our uh, was it the rising sun um, uh, Cerasus eastern redbud, it actually froze all the flowers off, and then I thought it wasn't even going to leaf out, but it did. But we were we were lucky. So it doesn't always work that way. Uh, another question in here? Yes. Larry. Yes. Um, is the apple ash borer also wiping out the fringe tree? Yes. It, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say wiping out, but the, so all these. So the question was Is the emerald ash borer affecting Cyanathus virginicus, the fringe tree, which is also in the olive family, which is what ash is in? And the emerald ash borer is killing. Cyanthus. Now, I maybe in a nursery where you've got a hundred of them, you might wipe out. The, but I've never heard of it actually wiping out Cyanthus. And it may be because for every thousand, you know, maybe there's ten thousand white ash. There might be one Cyanthus in an area. Of course, it's not native to New York, and I don't know what's happening down south because the emerald ash borer isn't down there yet. But when that gets down there with the other ashes, it might. Have a big impact on kind of infants. I have heard several years ago of uh, disappearing from Midwest. It's not a Midwestern species. It's a Mid Atlantic. I don't think it goes very far west at all, but it's mostly in the Carolinas, um, Georgia. When, when I say Midwest, I mean Ohio, Indiana. Oh, in plantings, then um, it might be, but I've not I've not heard that. So it might be one of those you want to take extra caution because of the emerald ash borer, and that's not going anywhere. So, mm -hmm. okay, question from okay, next Zoom question: If you are trying to restore a forest in a suburban setting, should you stick with plants and trees that are common in nearby forests, or should you should you put in any plants and trees that work in the conditions? My example is I have an ash slash silver and red. Maple box elder forest. You know, oh, this is okay to add oaks. Well, so you can add. So if you're, if you're, you're the question is basically, if you're going to restore a parcel close by to a existing parcel, to what extent do you replicate the same species? And so, so the. Adjacent forest might have might have historically had uh, swamp white oak in it, black gum in it, a lot of other species in it, but they could have been cut out, or the successional stage might be such that they haven't gotten there yet. So no, I would never. I would always put in my parcel that I'm restoring what makes sense to me versus you know, what the forests were like over time. The other problem with using the adjacent forest as a comparison is, so 80%, so let's say 20% of New York was, was forest. And we got all this forest since 1925 to 35. If you were to use those forests as a benchmark, what is missing across the board in those forests? 
it's it's gone in every one of those floors. In fact, what's that? Well, chestnut, yeah, but in terms of herbaceous species, any species dispersed by ant. So all of the um, bloodroot, the trilliums, they haven't made it back. They never made it back to those forests because they're dispersed by ants at a rate of one meter per year. And so we actually have an opportunity in many forests, you know, not Baltimore Woods, not Rantrack, because they're rather original forests, Green Lakes, but in almost every other forest, these forests have arisen over the last 100, 100 years, and they're missing elements that will never get there because of how we've uh, broken up the landscape. So even if you wanted to wait for the ants to bring the trilliums, they don't have a chance anyway because they have to cross too many roads and other things. That's why this idea of some type of assisted restoration, you know, makes a lot of sense in a lot of places. You just have to be, the other thing that we're thinking more about is we're trying to think of ways to create these food forest systems on the urban landscape. So in Syracuse, we have 1800 abandoned parcels. And those abandoned parcels have 0% ecological function. They don't do any about the transpiration. They don't do anything. So we're starting to replant some of these with layers of trees and shrubs and herbs to produce food. So that might include like Paul Paul in the sub canopy, shell bark in the overstory, ramps in the understory. And so uh, there are, I think, a lot of really cool opportunities today to think about restoring forests for various purposes. but. The only thing that we shouldn't be doing is ignoring basically all these abandoned lots. And they're in every town, there's plenty around here too, instead of doing something about them, because we, we need carbon capture. We need all these ecological functions to help with climate change issues. And by letting them remain blacktop or abandoned, that's not helping anything in the world. It's, it's making things even worse. We have the tools, we know what to do now. So let, let's start trying to do it. Was that, a, was that a Zoom question? Or... Yes. Well, um, so on the subject of mitigation, I was interested in that Honeywell mitigation project, the uh, the waste beds. Has that, do you, do you know what's happened to that area? Is that restored uh, ecologically or is that, is that sort of an emergency mitigation project? So the, the, the project, according to the government, has been restored. Uh, they, Honeywell and has met its obligations both in the lake and the surrounding landscape. Um, we were involved with a number of sites. Um, they look like they're doing fine. I mean, you know, people often don't read. So it took 10,000 years to get to these natural communities. And when you put something back from scratch, it's, it's not gonna exactly resemble what it will look like that came from you know, decades or centuries or millennia of that process. So are, are there still problems? I, I'm not aware, I'm sure there are, but I'm not aware of anybody measuring anything that says, you know what, you all, it looks good, but it's not working. But you know, there were a lot of people involved with these engineers and botanists and ecologists. And I, there was an effort, I think, to try to get it right. I'm sure some things aren't, but. We, I, we, I got a call in October that there was a group out from Honeywell, Consult Honeywell Consultants and a new salt spring emerged not far from Harbor Brook. So out of the blue, they found a new bubbling high salinity salt spring surrounded by Spartina alterniflora, which is this big salt marsh species down on Long Island. And we never planted it. The nearest planting is two miles away. And so did it get there from that planting? It didn't have much time or was it one of these pockets that we missed to begin with? But I think we're not done discovering new things about the lake, but uh, it's a, you know, a big place. When we came in 85, it was disgusting to drive by. It was disgusting to look at. I drove by a few days ago. There were nine eagles in one of the cottonwoods along the shore. There's a lot to celebrate, but whenever you're monkeying around with natural systems or trying to put a natural system back, it's not going to happen in, in just a few years. So I think the, the effort was sincere, I think, in trying to get it right. Okay. How do I check the acidity of my soil 
and on a half acre plot will it differ based on if it's under evergreens or not? Well, you can buy all kinds of forms of you know pH indicators from simple papers that are more or less accurate. Um, there were services that uh, you know Cornell used to test soils. I don't know if they do anymore. Um, but soil soils vary tremendously over a distance, and that's why whenever we do soil sampling for ecological purposes, we would take in a, in a given area and we would take twenty samples throughout that area, put it in a bucket, composite it, and then we do the sample, we do the analysis on that composite. Mm -hmm. If you ever just do it on that single sample, you almost always will regret it because the variation in uh, soils is, is pretty amazing. We work a lot in peatlands, which are very interesting in terms of microtopography. So you have the hollows that are standing water, and then you have the hummocks, which are removed. The pH can range from three, five on the hummock down to five in the hollow. Um, if you do this on a fendant, the, the range is even greater. So just over a meter, you can get these pretty extraordinary differences based on soil moisture and based on topographic position. But uh, it's ideally if you had somebody, I don't know if anybody, any nursery or anybody does any of those services here, but uh, I think you should be able to, and if you have a, if you have land, you can probably, based on the plants that are there, you can get a sense for the pH just by the type of plants that are there. If you have like partridge berry, you know, if you have like tea berry, then it's got to be acidic. Those plants don't grow in alkaline conditions. So it's really cool to start understanding the ecology of species to the point where you can start to read the landscape so that when you see this, you know that all of this is going to be with it, or at least you'll look for it. There's a good chance. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes the the big factor right now, like at Rand Track, a lot of things are missing at Rand Track simply because of deer. Mm -hmm. So deer have you know basically removed uh, most members of the rose family, the lily family. I mean, some the most attractive plants in the New York are the favorite of, of deer. You know, yeah. Cornell still does uh, analyze soil. It's mostly for ag applications, but they'll do pH, your nutrient content, uh, organic matter, those types of things. You still get to analyze them. Yeah. It takes a little while. Right. You probably did do your own with your own meters then. Uh, we just bought a salinity meter because we were tired of guessing what the salinity was based on the plant species. And good salinity meter, it cost us $1,000, but we're able to do things now that we've always wanted to do. And now we've got a thing we can just poke in the soil and get the salinity. Yes. The, the golden rod on the side of the highway, um, it's, it's not poisoned by the chemicals with that salt or? Well, it, it wouldn't be, you know, I don't know. If, you know I, I was urban more whether I need it, but as far as for, Nectar and for for pollen, um, it's not gonna, it's not an issue as far as we know. I mean, the salinities are really extraordinary, but the plants can take that. Um, we've not done any kind of chemical composition, but I mean, it would in these food forest systems in urban places that is of concern. We we're working with folks at Syracuse uh, University in food science, mm -hmm. and there's one of the cooperators. That's what she does is she analyzes plants for those concerns. Uh, we know right now that there are people who have migrated to from this area in the last 10, 20, 30 years who are collecting urban plants. And mm -hmm. sometimes those end up in beyond their, their table, they end up in other places like restaurants and things. And so it's something to be concerned about, but um, it's not, those things are not easy to do, unfortunately. Okay. How would one deal with invasive ranunculus that has taken over a good part of the land? Ranunculus vicaria. And, and is there a plant that would help them keep Canada goldenrod? So Canada goldenrod, I'll start with that, is one of the most invasive native plants there is. And it has this remarkable ability by rhizomes to just take over. And it's basically in ecological systems, whatever is the most uh, thug-like, uh, the most, the biggest will will win out. Now, this ranunculus is the other extreme. It's only that tall. 
we've been battling it for three years in our garden. And um, the good news is, is that it disappears automatically. It disappears by late spring. And then it comes back next spring. But anyway, in the it's not something that, because it's so small stature, if you're interested in lawn, it's a problem. But anything else you want to grow, it usually is not a problem. But you know, I've seen people write about how beautiful it is, and it is because it blooms early. But it is a really nasty. It's got these uh, vegetative um, structures under the soil that you can kill the top of those. I don't know if they're turians or what they are, but they're hard to get rid of. But that is, that's not one of the top 100 species that concern me. It's uh, although it is abundant, but only briefly. <laughs> yes. All oak weld. So, yeah, oak weld is the, so the old genus for Dutch elm disease was Ceratocystis. And, uh, that's the genus for the current oak wilt problem. It's a fungus, and it's a great concern, especially on the red oaks. Although it does apparently get on some others. But Levi, you want to up? We have a one of the uh, up and coming tree experts, uh, uh, Levi O'Brien, is uh, is is sitting here. And what what's your take on oak wilt? There's only a couple of verified populations in the state. I think I think it's only been found a couple of times by the DEC. We're looking for more when it, when it crops up, vectored by beetles, and that spreads underground by root graft. Um, so very similar to Dutch elm disease. But they haven't, they found a lot of the beetles, but they haven't found many infected oaks in this region. It's more of the Great Lakes uh, area issue. So something to keep on our uh, radar. So if you want to know more about uh, trees, uh, you can join the Levi's uh, Instagram account, uh, Levi O'Brien. What's, what do you have now? 100,000? Uh, I think 86. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 86. Only 86,000 followers. So Levi is a former student uh, at ESF as an undergrad and um, has uh, gotten really excited about learning about trees. He's back as a grad student, but um, he's the place to go for anything about uh, Trees, Levi O'Brien. And he says he's anxious to give talks. So, uh, <laughs> any of you uh, want to get for a talk? He, he charges a lot more than me, then. So. <laughs> okay, follow up with a question on, on trying to reforest this further lot. Um, is there a reference to go to to determine what trees and plants were originally in a lonely forest? So I can well, so it goes back to the ecological communities of New York State. If you go to that, it'll tell you where that community was in the state. If you sort of have a sense for what you had, um, like it was oak hickory or sugar maple or whatever, I would use that as a list of species. Um, but there's nothing, you know, there's no such thing as a, if you were to look for a certain area of the state, this is what the forest was like right here, you know, the, some of us can figure that out, but it's it's not it's not that straightforward. But. Okay, I think you've all had enough yet. To